Welcome, everybody. Um, again, I can't believe it's April already because <laughs> the year is zipping by. Um, as usual, um, you're all on mute for the time being, but when we get to the point where you can ask questions, we'll, we'll unmute you and you can put things into the chat window if you want to ask any questions. We are recording tonight's session, so if you don't want to uh, have your face appear on YouTube, then please uh, perhaps turn your camera off or something. Uh, we've got a fantastic speaker tonight. We've got Steve Hartley, G0FUW. You may recognise Steve's name. Um, or call sign Steve has been in the Red Amateur Radio for quite a long time, haven't you, Steve? <laughs> Done lots mm -hmm. of things, heavily involved in the RSGB, heavily involved in training. I know, Steve, you're an ex-chairman, I think, aren't you, of the RSGB at one point? So uh, pretty well respected and well known. Um, you may recognise Steve has written a few of the books as well. I think uh, the book I think I read around, was it The Intermediate? exam i can't remember how you think yeah. you wrote so uh done a lot of stuff i think you're also the kind of the project manager for the yota event i think you weren't you when it happened over here yeah, yeah. so um yeah so um so yeah i'm going to hand over to steve uh and uh steve's going to talk to us tonight about the gqrp club so steve i'm going to hand over to you and uh thank yeah, you very you much go. and good evening to everyone um before i start have we got any GQRP club members. Uh, oh, there's a few thumbs going up there, so uh, that's uh, that's good. I um, always like to ch check the audience before I uh, <laughs> start speaking. Um, not that I'm going to say anything uh, untoward, but uh, let me uh, let me share my screen, and then we can uh, get cracking. Here we go. So as Chris um, introduced me, there I, I've been licensed for. Uh, for many many years now, in 1983, I think it was, I, I took my uh, exam and uh, I, I sort of got my first license, and then did the CW as you had to do in those days to get on HF, and um, um, been with the, the, the G0 FUW call sign now for uh, oh, I think it was 1985. I got that call sign or thereabouts anyway. So um, I, I've been been batting with that uh, that call sign for a long time. It's been been part of my life for, for, for a long time. Um, I always describe myself as an amateur amateur uh, and by that I mean that I have no professional links with amateur radio or, or even radio communications. I, 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 I'm a, a retired civil servant, um, some would say a pen pusher but uh, I, I was a very active uh, guy out and about in, in the field um and uh, i still do some work in uh, in education but uh, uh, very much part time these days um so yeah been around the amateur radio world for a long time i've been involved in training uh, others to to get involved in amateur radio for for a very long time i think that started around about 1992 or thereabouts uh, when i was up in cumbria in the lake district uh, and I've uh, been doing that ever since in, in different places. And uh, Currently, uh, I live in the southwest of England in the city of Bath, which is uh, a very nice place to be. And uh, we, uh, we run a, a training scheme from here called the Bath-based distance learning, which uh, has come into its own in lockdown. Uh, we've got lots and lots of students currently studying for, uh, for their uh, exams using the, this sort of uh, tutorial method. Uh, and lots of uh, additional training material besides. So that's all, all keep, keeps us very busy. Um, in terms of the QRP club, I, I came in, well, I joined the QRP club before I was licensed and uh, I've been a member all the way through that. And uh, about must be three years ago now, um, there was a call went out for, for help, basically. Would anybody like to help uh, with the club? and? I put my hand up and said I'd be very willing to help and uh, was asked if I'd take on the role as chairman. And uh, having been the chairman of the RSGB previously, um, I, I think they, they thought I'd be eminently suited for the job. Uh, and, I, and I've thoroughly enjoyed it, I have to say. It's, uh, it's a great uh, club to, uh, to be at the, the, the helm and uh, a very rewarding uh, uh, position to, to be in. And um, yeah, I've been doing that ever since. and and. I have to say the, the club's going from, from strength to strength. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll tell you a bit about the club this evening. So what am I going to talk about? Um, I, I, I sort of, I like to talk to questions in, in terms of that and try and answer some questions that people might have and perhaps blow away a few myths that grow up around the, uh, the subject. Um, I'm sure you've all got your own ideas about QRP and what it is and 
the fact you're listening to to this and uh, it suggests that you feel vaguely interested. Um, so I hope it uh, it answers some of the questions that you've got. And um, I, I, I pinched the cover of the RSGB's book, the QRP Basics, which I think has just been rewritten, but uh, that, that was the, the copy I've got on my shelf. And uh, we're going to talk about the basics today. And uh, if, if you want the deep, deep detail, uh, I, I said to Chris earlier, I'll, I'll share a, a, a handout with, uh, with him and he can put it on the website, wherever, uh, which has got lots of other references that you can follow up and, uh, and get more information at, at the end. Um, so I won't go through that agenda. You, you can see it for yourself, but we're going to cover uh, some stuff about the club and about operating QRP. And at the end, if you've got questions, more than happy to take those. Um, so if you've got them, pop them in the chat and we'll come back to you or we'll, we'll wait to the end and stick your hand up. We'll, uh, we'll, uh, we'll certainly uh, address those uh, as best we can at the end. So first one is what is QRP? And uh, it, it does mean different things to different people. Um, it, it, I always joke that um, it, 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 some of our Italian uh, friends uh, have a very different idea about what QRP is than, uh, uh, than in the UK, but um, uh, there is an internationally agreed level, um, whether people abide by it is a different matter, but um, uh, so if, if you're operating CW, 5 watts output, and uh, if it's SSB, then 10 watts PEP, that's the, the, the level that we, uh, we operate with the club and, and say, most countries uh, see that as being the, the QRP levels these days. But the origins of it go way, way back, uh, right back to, uh, to, to, to the sort of telegraphy days. And um, QRP with a question mark meant, can you reduce your power? Uh, and the response QRP meant, yes, I can. And, and it meant obviously you, you were using more power than you needed to to make the contact. So uh, it, it kind of became a way of operating uh, based on that, that if you could operate with low power, uh, then that was QRP operating. Uh, so that's where the label came from. Um, but it, it is good operating practice to, um, um, to keep your power down. And I think all the books that you read tend to say that you should only use the, 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 the maximum power that you need to make the contact. And uh, uh, the number of times that you hear people going, you know, well, you're, you're 5, 9 plus 40 dB, clearly using a bit too much power there, guys. You know, you could crank it back a wee bit and, uh, uh, and be a bit more efficient with your electricity and, uh, and perhaps keep the spectrum clean as well. So uh, it, it, QRP isn't just about a, a sort of uh, an ethos of, of low power. It, it's actually a good thing to do. And, um, uh, and, and hopefully if more people did that, we might find the bands are a bit cleaner and a bit less polluted shall we say but um it, it's not everybody's cup of tea and i have to say i i don't see it as a taking a pledge that um you could never operate above these levels i've got 100 watt radios uh and confession time I, I've, I've even got a, a linear amplifier that i've built um um I, I never use it but it was an interesting project to build and uh I have to say, I, I was extremely nervous as the, the watt meter was creeping up above uh, 200, 300 watts. And uh, yeah, I, it, it, it's never got further than that, really. I tested it, but um, um, I, I, I much prefer operating with low power. And for those who are really sort of into extreme uh, QRP, we, we've got this designation QRPP, uh, a small P at the end, uh, which means less than one watt out or in other ways, milliwatts, um, you know, pe people operating with uh, with milliwatts. And I, I've done a bit of that, and it's uh, it's amazing what you can do. And uh, I, I was working some stations with 500 milliwatts in a contest because the, the contest had a rule or, or a scoring system that the less power you use, the more points you scored. So by working someone with uh, 500 milliwatts, you, you effectively doubled your score than if you were using one watt. So... Uh, it, that was good fun to see what was possible and uh, it, it certainly in the early mornings it was easy to uh, to make contacts with that low power once the band started to get a bit busier not quite so easy but um, but good fun anyway um and i've used a picture to illustrate this the uh, the the watt meter which uh, i've uh, got on my uh, my shelf the sanford uh, by by kanga products a really excellent watt meter Sadly, Kanga Products is uh, is currently closed down. Uh, Dennis, who, who run it, has decided to retire. 
uh, but we're expecting them to reappear with a, a new owner in the not too distant future. But uh, if you ever see one of these knocking about at a rally, um, pick it up because they're a really good uh, uh, watt meter and uh, uh, very accurate. And uh, you've got a little sample port there to uh, to plug into a, an oscilloscope or something that uh, or perhaps an SDR so you can see what sort of uh, uh, spectrum that uh, you, you put into the, uh, the dummy load. So very, uh, a very useful bit of kit that. So the, the QRP club of which I am the chairman, a um, little bit of history on that before we get into uh, some of the, the, the nitty gritty detail. Um, none of this would have uh, happened without uh, George Dobbs, uh, who, who you can see there at his, uh, his old typewriter. Um, because uh, when the club started, this was very much uh, uh, quite literally a parish council sort of uh, organized thing it was uh, George was the reverend uh, uh, at the time I think he was in um, uh, in Cleethorpes and uh, he, uh, uh, he he was a vicar and, and you know, used the, uh, the sort of church office to to run the QRP club and uh, it, it actually started in in 1974 um, I was still at school then and uh, uh, the clipping that you can see in the center of the slide uh, is the first real mention of the QRP club and that comes from a, a magazine called Shortwave magazine that used to be uh, very popular in the UK um, and uh, and it talked there about George taking on the role or, or perhaps being thrust into the, the role by others um, to say if there was enough interest that there was going to be a QRP club and um, sadly all the call signs that are mentioned there are no longer with us they're all silent key um, but that was the the start of the, the QRP club in 1974 and here we are was that 46 and a half years later um, we're still going uh, so we've got a very long history uh, uh, as a club and uh, one of the beauties of the club is it, it's always been run on a, a very much a, a small uh, sort of overhead basis and, and they currently have a committee of four just as a chairman myself uh, secretary Dick um, G's or BPS, uh, Graham is our treasurer, G3 MFJ, uh, and Daphne, G7 ENA, is our membership secretary. Uh, and that's the committee. And, and we don't go in for the sort of formal meetings and minutes and all, all of that. We, we meet when we need to and we get things done and, um, and it works very, very well. Uh, we've got lots of other key players, uh, people like Tex, uh, G1TEX, who runs, uh, who edits Sprat for us, the magazine, and uh, um, we've got Tony Fishpool, G4WIF, who runs our website, and there's lots of other guys who, who, who do their own little bits and pieces, and together it, it works really, really well. And they're all volunteers, we've got no paid staff, um, so it, we, we, we rely on, on volunteer support, and, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm never um, sort of... But I'm always amazed that we, we, we still get the, the volunteers coming forward and uh, usually if we need something doing, somebody uh, comes forward and that was always one of George's things. I mean, it was almost a, uh, a sort of holy thing that, you know, when, when, the, when needs must, you know, it will be provided and, and, and that seems to be the way it works, that people come forward and, and offer to do things and it's, it's very, very good. Um, we, try, we try not to make a profit, uh, so we, we keep things uh, as, as cheap as we can, and um, the, the UK membership is, is just six pounds per year. Uh, and I always say it's the best six quid you'll ever spend uh, in, the, in your amateur radio hobby. Uh, it, it's excellent value in, and I would say that because I'm the chairman, but uh, other people say it as well, so I, I think it's well worth it. So what do you get for your six quid a year? Um, um, all sorts of, of members benefits come with uh, with being a member we, we've we've had 4,000 members for for at least the last 10 years if not longer um it, it kind of bobbles up and down but uh, it always seems to be around about that level uh, and we've had i think a total of about 16 or 17,000 people have been members at some point uh, but we've always got this sort of core of 4,000 members uh, uh, that, that, that keep uh, keep paying their subscriptions uh, we have a club call sign, G5LOW, uh, so five watts and low power. Uh, it's a, a, a great call sign, I think. Uh, and we use that for um, sort of events and uh, the occasional contest and activity periods and things. And, uh, and that picture in the middle is the QSL card. If you work G5LOW, uh, 
uh, you get a QSL card that looks uh, exactly like that. Um, one of the biggest benefits of being a member is Sprat. Uh, and on the QSL card, there's, there's an example up there at, at the top corner. Um, it's now a full colour magazine, comes out once every quarter, um, A5 size, so you can pop it in your pocket and read it on the, uh, the tube or, or, or the train. Um, and it's full of circuits and construction information and um, well, all, all, all sorts of things that you'd expect from a low power magazine. And, and it covers such a wide range of things from valves to digital circuits to uh, a metal bashing even we've we've got um, uh, the, the the guy who's on the cover there john um I think john uh, built a thing called the shack on a pole uh, and it was a mechanical sort of construction project with a a table and a thing to put his rig on and, and it supported his antenna it, it literally was a, a shack on a pole uh, and he did a talk for us at the convention last year about uh, the, how he'd done that and the, the engineering that went into it it was fascinating really really good talk um Club sales is our other big benefit that people uh, get, get a lot out of. Um, the, the sales team over here, that's Graham and his wife uh, who, who, uh, who run the, uh, the sales uh, from, from the garage at their house. Um, we sell components, we sell books, we sell kits and anything else that's interest to members, uh, quite frankly. Um, I was saying to Chris earlier, we've got a complete archive of Sprat, uh, which traditionally has gone out on a, a disc but many computers these days don't have a disk drive. So uh, this year we started selling it on a memory stick and we, we tagged it Sprat on a stick uh, and that's been selling really well. And so you can get the, the whole 40 year archive for I think about five pounds or something. It's, it's, a, it's remarkably cheap for, for what you get in. Um, I'll talk more about kits later on. Uh, um, but the, the other things we do, we, we have awards and trophies. So there's a couple of um, uh, activity periods that we have during the year. One of them, the winter sports runs from Christmas to New Year. Uh, the other one is every year on International QRP Day. That's the 17th of June. Um, whoever puts the best login on the 17th or for the 17th of June gets an award. And, and there are others as well for best article in Sprat and, and so on and so forth. So we've got a, a nice sort of reward system going on there. Uh, we've got our own QSL bureau, uh, so if uh, if you want to send uh, QSL cards to other QRP operators, we, we do that. We have a website, as you might imagine. Uh, there's lots of technical information on there, circuits and, and stuff about uh, uh, components and how to use them. And uh, the more recent addition is we've now got a YouTube channel. So all the talks that we had at the convention last year are now available on the YouTube channel. So uh, if, if you've got an interest in that, just, just go on YouTube, put GQRP Club in, uh, and you should find the channel. And there's uh, there's a whole raft of things there. And we run conventions uh, every year. There's been a convention uh, for for quite some time, and uh, uh, that's uh, going to continue hopefully this year as well. And uh, you see the, the the these are the guys at the Buildathon a couple of years ago when we were at the convention. We we built a a variable frequency oscillator, and uh, after the Buildathon. We had a drift-a-thon to see uh, who built the most stable VFO. What the builders didn't know is that I'd mixed in some fairly rubbish capacitors in some of the kits. So it, it was potluck whether they got a good one or a bad one, but it was, it was good fun. We had a, a leaderboard and uh, to see who could uh, who, who could get the best VFO, and uh, they all worked in the end. It was uh, it was a good evening that. Here's a little bit more detail about the conventions. Um, it, the, the first one was in 1989 uh, and that was held at Rochdale when uh, George had moved to Rochdale as the vicar of St Aidan uh, parish and uh, he, he opened up his church hall and the church for that matter uh, as a, a convention venue and it was uh, it was a great uh, great success and um, I, I got some very fond memories of, of going up there uh, and one in particular sitting in the church because all the lectures were done in the church, not from the pulpit, but it was almost like that. Um, uh, and uh, guy, one of the members was talking about building antennas from bamboo poles and uh, it was absolutely fascinating and uh, th thoroughly enjoyable. Over the years that kind of outgrew itself and um, 
the, the, the convention was moved to Rishworth, which was uh, not, not a million miles from Rochdale, up in the, uh, in the Pennines, uh, at a school there. And the picture you can see is the school hall full of traders uh, and, and people selling QRP bits and components. And you can see there there's fishing rods for aerials and a whole, whole mix of, uh, of, of bits and pieces. Um, again, very successful. It had its own lecture theatre and we did build-a-thons in the school uh, laboratories and uh, there for a while. And uh, it really, really was, uh, it was very good. The local club provided car parking attendance and very well organised and uh, had great attendance every year. And then it got to the point where a lot of the guys who did the organising um, felt they couldn't do it anymore. The, the, the years were rolling on and it was getting very much hard work. So um, the, uh, the venue was changed then to Telford uh, and the Telford Club offered to host the convention as part of their Hamfest. So uh, we've been running that now for I think, three years uh, uh, with, in conjunction with the Telford Club and uh, we've done them in hotels. The last physical one we did uh, was at a, a university campus near Telford and that was really good because it was bags of room, lots of car parking and uh, re really good facilities. Uh, so we're, we hope to return there at some point. Of course, COVID-19 um, put the mockers on last year's convention. We, we couldn't meet physically last year. So um, we, I sort of threw the idea up, well, could we do it online uh, as a virtual convention? And before I knew it, again, volunteers came forward. We had a, a, an organizing committee and um, speakers were, were well coming out of our ears we ended up with a two-day convention jam full of really good speakers from um, all sorts of places canada america turkey france obviously uk um, uh, and uh, it, it was an absolute brilliant um, uh, event we we had over 500 people attending it uh, we got some new members joining as a result of it so it really was a, a, a fantastic thing. And as I said earlier, all the, the talks uh, that were given are now available on, on our YouTube channel. So uh, if you want to know about uh, building your own loops and doing experiments with mag loops or building your own transceivers, um, operating on FTA, you name it, there's, there's, there's talks in there. Uh, we had Hans Summers uh, talking about his QRP lab kits and uh, uh, Callan, the DX, from DX Commander, talked about his aerial exploits and things. It was, it was well, I, I, so I am biased, but I thought it was a really good event and the feedback we had was uh, suggested that it really was. So this year we're planning uh, the weekend, the 4th and 5th of September, to, to do the convention again. Uh, we're hoping it might be a live event, but even if it is a live event, we're going to have online access because so it was so successful last year with people joining from all all three IARU regions. We had some people in Australia um, who, uh, who stayed up very late and we had some guys on the, uh, uh, the west coast of the USA who got up very early uh, to attend. It was, uh, it was absolutely fantastic to have all those people joining together in, in, in a, an, literally an international gathering. It was, it was fantastic. So uh, yeah, 4th and 5th of September, put that in your diary if you're interested and, uh, uh, and keep an eye on the uh, uh, the GQRP website to, to get more details. So let's think about QRP. What, what can be achieved? And uh, the question that I'm often asked, is there any point using low power? Um, and the short answer is yes, there is. Um, in the UK, we have this uh, foundation license and every one of those guys and gals are QRP operators, specifically on, on SSB. Um, because they're limited to 10 watts so by default they are a, a QRP station and um, I've got a guy who, who lives about 10 miles away from me I, I put him through his foundation license a few years ago and uh, uh, every now and again he'll ring me up and say Steve 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 you know I've just worked Thailand or I've just worked Indonesia or I was talking to a guy in the States who knew you and <laughs> um, he, he, he's absolutely loving his amateur radio and, and if anybody says Oh, well, they all run too much power. Um, that guy has an FT817, which you know is, is a maximum of five watts. So uh, he can't be using more power because he hasn't got the radio to do it. So uh, yes, you can work things with uh, with low power. 
Um, and for those who doubt what you can do and, and say, I've got, I've got to have my linear coupled up, uh, otherwise I'm just not going to make contacts. Um, this is something that George passed down to me uh, when we were talking about what, what can you achieve with QRP? And he, he used it a lot. And I, I sort of followed suit. Um, and the scenario is this, that you're talking to someone who is running 400 watts and on your S meter, they're re registering S9 plus 6 dB. And all the th textbooks tell us that one S point is equivalent to a 6 dB uh, increase in, uh, in, in signal strength. So if that guy who was running the 400 watts halves his power and halves it again to get 6 dB down to the, the S9 point, that gives him 100 watts output. And if he comes down another 6 dB, that's down to 25 watts, you'd be S8 then. And you can follow that logic down. And uh, surprise, surprise, right at the bottom though, with 750 milliwatts, you're still S5, which is not a bad signal. So if you're running at the five, 10 watt level, you know, it, it's not unusual to get reports of, uh, you know, uh, five and nine uh, or, or, or sorry, five and five or, or, or five and seven, something like that, because the science tells you that's what should happen. Um, so it, it, of course it only works if the noise is less than S7, <laughs> because otherwise it can be, you can be fighting with the noise, but, um, but it, it's just an illustration that you do not need all that massive power to, to make contacts. You can make contacts with, with a lot less power. So, uh, so yes, there is some point in doing it and uh, there are benefits to it as well. well. We'll look at it in a minute. So what can you achieve? Um, a lot of people think, well, that's fine for working across town and, and, and the cartoon there shows, you know, the uh, fantastic DX from, uh, from number 22 to number 23 Acacia Avenue. Um, uh, and I've, I've never worked anybody next door, but I've worked people across the road. When I lived down in Gosport for a while, and there was a guy across the road who was licensed, and we uh, we used to talk on the radio. <laughs> we could probably have shouted across the garden fence, but we used to use the radio. Um, but my experience of, of operating um, QRP is that it, it's very much a, a viable mode. And um, people say, well, well What's the furthest you've worked with QRP? And um, I, I say, well, New Zealand, um, that's pretty far away. In fact, you can't get much farther away than that from, uh, from the UK. Um, I've worked VK, Australia, I've worked the States, Canada, uh, you know, all over Europe and, and Scandinavia. Um, not so, the one place I've never worked is South America, um, not, not from this location anyway. And I think that's more to do with the fact the the topography of the, the ground. I've got some really well, quite high hills in the direction of South America that are quite close. So uh, I, I don't think I can get a, a decent takeoff in that direction. But all, all the other directions are, I, I can work and, uh, and I've got QSL cards from people I've worked with, with my QRP. And um, so you know, from my point of view, it's, uh, it, it, it's certainly viable and uh, uh, I'm still getting QSL cards for for, for, for people that I've worked sort of years ago, uh, as happens. Um, one of the things that we did during lockdown, uh, this was quite interesting, was the the RSGB run a, a series of, uh, of QSO parties. And the idea was that every day for 90 minutes, you could get on the air and uh, it was a different mode each day. So it sort of went SSB, CW, um, FT8, and then I think it went back to SSB and CW and then it did RITI or it, it was sort of cycled around the uh, different times of day uh, and different modes. And um, that call sign that you saw earlier, G5LOW, we, we got different members on different days to operate with the different modes. And uh, we, we thought well, with our QRP, you know, do we stand a chance to get anywhere with, uh, with this? And, and we did, we, we had great fun. and. Uh, uh, we, we, we made contacts uh, all over the place and uh, we found that we came, I've got it written down here, let me just check my, my things, I don't give you any good information. Um, we were in the number, I think we were 50 out of 500 entrants. Um, so, you know, we weren't top of the chop by any means, but um, we, uh, we managed to get uh, uh, certainly into the top 50. Uh, using QRP. So that, that, we thought that was pretty good. And then when I looked at the results for individual stations, what we found was the top, out of the top 10, 
um, stations overall, and this was you know across the the uh, the 500 stations that took part, three of the top 10 were QRP stations. Uh, and these are guys who, who really go for it. They're, you know, they're, they're, they're very good operators, um, but they were competing with P, with 400 watt stations, and uh, they, they managed to get into the top 10. And uh, the one of our members, G4 ARI Tim, he actually came second overall with his QRP, and uh, a, a fantastic achievement uh, it was. So. Again, the evidence there is that um, yeah, we, we, we you can work things with uh, with QRP. But let's have a look at a few others and see what they've been up to. Let me just take a quick slurp of my wet my whistle. Um, some of you may know the name um, George uh, GM30XX uh, George Burt. Uh, sadly, no longer with us, but uh, a, a brilliant QRP in his day. Uh, left us with lots of uh, very simple QRP transmitter designs. And um, George managed, before he passed away, to work over 300 countries, with all of them with homebrew radios and all of them with less than one watt or less. Uh, and the, the circuit that's on the um, slide there is one of his designs that he worked, well, he worked the world with this thing. Um, and it, 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 you're just the... Um, uh, the PA so you get one watt out on whatever band you fancy and um, the, it's such a simple circuit that it, you make one for each band you don't have a multi-band thing you just use one for each band and uh, and George used circuits like this throughout his life he was also a great microwaver um, very good technical uh, guy uh, and he operated microwaves and uh, had records in, in the book for that as well so uh, absolute fantastic uh, guy and uh, when I was first licensed, I used to read about his exploits. And, and in those days, before email and that, I wrote him a letter and said, what, what kind of aerial have you got to be doing all of this? And uh, he said, it's just a, a doublet. Um, basically, so I put the longest bit of wire up I can, and I feed it in the center with some open wire feeder, tune it up with a Z match, and, and there we go. And oh, by the way, it's on top of a 20 story um, tower block in the middle of Edinburgh. <laughs> Um, so he had a pretty good takeoff. I think it was the highest building for, for miles around. Um, so he had, he had a great takeoff. But uh, um, yeah, that, that was him. A very simple wire antennas, QRP uh, radios, but being in the right place at the right time to work those 300 DXCC entities. So, um, you know, that, that, that was George. A little bit more up to date. Uh, this is Carl, GW0VSW. And uh, Carl is another fantastic operator. He, um, he, he gets on the air pretty much every day. And um, he's won our Chelmsley Trophy, which is uh, the one we award for the best log of the year. So um, people keep a record of what they've worked throughout the year, submit the log, uh, uh, um, it, the best one. And it's not the one with the most contacts or the most DXCCs. It's kind of a, an amalgam of all that. The guy who won this year, uh, one of his things, I think he'd used a, a total of 28 different transceivers through the year on different bands and different modes and things like that. So it's, it isn't just about the numbers, but uh, this, this was Carl's figures for 2019, which wasn't the best year for um, uh, propagation, if, uh, if you remember. We were right down in the doldrums on the, uh, the sunspot cycle. Uh, but he made over 1,400 QSOs through the year. Um, majority on CW, but a fair chunk on SSB as well. Uh, nearly 120 of them were two-way QRP. So that's where he was working another QRP station. He managed 71 DXCC entities in that 12 month period. And he used all bands from 160 to 10 meters. Um, his main rig was a Zygu, is it? A G90 um, with four watts output into a G5RV again wire antenna so he wasn't using beams or anything fancy um, he, he, he just got on the air and, and, and made it happen as you can see he's got a fantastic uh, collection of keys at the back here he's uh, that's one of his things he collects uh, keys um, but these things here uh, are trophies that he's won from the QRP club because not only did he win the Chelmsley trophy in 2019 
he won it in 2018 and 1999. So he's, um, uh, and I think he was runner up one year as well. So uh, a really good operator, great guy. And um, uh, again, it just shows that you can, uh, you can achieve things with QRP, uh, even when the sunspots are, are not in our favor. So a slightly different question, why would you do this? <laughs> why would you go QRP? Um, I guess it's a bit like the old Everest thing. Why climb Everest? Because it's there, you know. And, uh, um, but there, there are a few different reasons on this slide why people go QRP. And everybody's got their own reason. Uh, that there isn't a sort of universal answer to that question. Uh, probably one of the, the key things is portability. And, and the guys on the slide, I think it's the Hereford uh, Radio Club, um, they go off onto the, uh, the Malvern Hills to do uh, QRP operating uh, from... Uh, you know, battery power and things like that. So you couldn't really run a kilowatt station from the top of a, a mountain or something like that, unless you've got a whole bunch of pack horses or something to carry your gear. Um, so having low power gear with low um, uh, sort of energy batteries and things like that means that you can, uh, you, you can go portable very easily. Uh, and I've done a bit of that myself. And I think the, the heaviest thing is probably the batteries. Uh, followed by the antenna. The, the radio is almost a, a secondary thing. Um, but lots of people do that. Um, summits on the air and things like that. People have, uh, are using QRP for that. And uh, it, it become a very popular uh, pastime. The second reason people tend to go QRP, and, and, and I'll put myself in this one, is, is the low cost. Uh, I distinctly remember going to the amateur radio shop in 1983 or whenever it was uh, with uh, uh, the first Mrs. Hartley and uh, um, asking the guy how much the transceivers were. Uh, and uh, he, he quoted me a price. And at the time, I think it was either, either six or eight weeks salary. Uh, so a couple of months salary to, to buy one of these uh, Yesu uh, black box things. And uh, uh, I got that look that we all know when you get the look from uh, from your other half that it ain't going to happen. Uh, and I, I became quite downhearted and thought, well, I'm never going to get into this amateur radio business if uh, if I can't buy a transceiver. And then I discovered through George Dobbs that you could build your own and uh, that the cost was a lot less uh, than buying a, a radio. And I found that you actually learned stuff. It was uh, it was quite interesting and, and educational and, and enjoyable frustrating at times but um you know i i thoroughly enjoyed uh, building my own radio and uh, so uh, I, I through the qrp club I, I that's that was my entry into the uh, the hobby something that's very topical um <clears throat> and, and i've introduced it uh, for the first time tonight because I, I thought it was quite topical um we're just about to have to do these emf assessments for uh, amateur radio stations in the uk um, basically to see if you're going to fry your neighbour or not. And um, if you're operating QRP, most of the time you're going to be well below the threshold for this because uh, what our regulator has said is if you're radiating less than 10 watts EIRP, um, you don't need to worry. Uh, that, that, that's deemed to be a compliance station. So um, a lot of QRPers are sitting back going, well, I don't need to worry about that. The guy who's got his kilowatt amplifier and uh, a six element beam or something like that uh, is going to have more of a, an issue, perhaps. Um, so um, that's a benefit of going QRP, perhaps, that uh, you, you don't need to worry about uh, uh, any uh, EMF radiation. And of course, follows on from that. If you're not radiating as much energy, you've probably got a, a lower EMC risk. You're not going to wipe your neighbor's telly out quite so much. Or you're, uh, um, uh, there's a guy I know down in Gosport, and uh, I'm not quite sure how much power he run, but it was quite a bit. Uh, and he, when he operated at night, he used to make his neighbor's lights flicker on and off in the uh, in the garage, and uh, and they thought they had a ghost or something. It was uh, quite funny, but uh, it, it was. Uh, I won't say his name, but it was, uh, it was the guy who was, who was talking on his, uh, on his radio. Um, I think the last one on the, is perhaps one of the things that most people come into QRP is the challenge of it. Um, a number of people I've seen who they've, they've got their, their license, they've got their uh, high powered rig and their fancy antennas and all the rest of it. And they've worked DXCC in a year or, or less 
and they sit back and go, well, what do I do now? And um, doing it all again with low power is, is a challenge. Uh, so a lot of people have come to QRP because they've got bored of shooting fish in a barrel, as, uh, as the phrase goes, uh, and, and having to be a little bit more uh, sort of wily about uh, operating is something that people find uh, attractive. So as I say, there isn't one reason why you would go QRP, but those are some of them, and, and hopefully you, you recognise something in that for, for yourselves. So are there any downsides to QRP? Yes, there are. Um, it can be very frustrating. Um, if you hear a station you want to work and you're trying to call them and everybody else has got high power going, then you're not going to be heard. There's no two ways about that. Um, you, again, you need to be a little bit uh, bit canny about when you call and how you call and, uh, and, and pick your moments. So that can be frustrating, especially if it's a, a country that you really want to, to get in the log. But you know, if you bide your time, usually you can uh, you can get in there. And I, I, I can't remember which station it was now, but there was a, a de-expedition on and I tried to work them. And every day it was a wall to wall. And then one morning I switched on and they were calling CQ and nobody was answering. And uh, I called them and uh, they came straight back. We had the contact, the QSL card arrived not too much later. So uh, if, if you're patient, you can, uh, you, you can get there. One of the biggest downsides of QRP is the Mickey taking that you get and the jibes that life's too short for QRP. Why would you do that? Um, I usually turn that around and, and, and point to this challenge thing that the number of people who come to QRP because they've got, they've got bored of operating with high power. Uh, and I say life's too long for QRO. You know, you, you achieve everything you want to do very quickly. And then what do you do? Um, so, um, yeah, if, if you say you're going to start operating QRP, it won't be long before somebody says, oh, life's too short. And uh, yeah, it, it's uh, it's not really true. It's uh, I always take the view that amateur radio is a, a very broad hobby and there's room for everybody. And uh, if somebody wants to operate high power, that's fine. If somebody wants to go QRP, leave them and, uh, and let them get on with it. Uh, you know, I think life's too short for arguments, never mind QRP. <laughs> and the other thing which the cartoon's trying to depict is that sometimes miniature equipment can be a, a downside to QRP. Uh, some of the radios that people build, are, you know, they fit in a little mint tin, or an Altoids mint tin or something like that. Um, or, 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 you know, um, you can have one guy built thing into a, a matchbox or something that uh, to, to prove it could be done. Uh, I find that miniature equipment is very frustrating. I, I my, my fat fingers can't press the buttons or the, the, it, it, it can, it's just too small for me. I, I like a radio to be radio sized. So my, my equipment tends to be a little bit bigger than it needs to be uh, because I just like it that way. Uh, and the number of times I've built some of these small circuits and then I've been looking for them a a week or a fortnight later from going, I know it's here somewhere and it's it's buried under a paperback book or something and, and, and you do lose them. So uh, um, it, it, it can be uh, can be frustrating. Now I've mentioned home brewing a couple of times and, and building radios. And um, again, a question I get asked is, do, do people still build radios? Why would you do that? You just go down to Martin Lynch or Radio World or Moonraker or, and just buy what you want. Uh, and certainly the cost is not as big a, an issue as it used to be. Um, you know, you can go and buy, I, if I, I saw a thing uh, the other day, uh, a, a dual band handheld uh, thing for two metres and 70 centimetres. And it's about 30 quid or something, you know, it's r ridiculously cheap, you know, almost like use it for a weekend and then throw it away kind of idea. Um, so, it, yeah, why would you build your own radio if you can go away and buy them so cheap? Well, Again, it's the fun, I guess, the, 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 and, and the educational side of it, learning how things work and, and getting that satisfaction of building something yourself rather than uh, having it sort of given to you. Uh, and do people do it? Yes, they do. And, and our club sales, I, I pointed out Graham earlier, um, he, he looks after the club sales. And in the 15 years that he's been doing that role, he sold over 1,000 kits, uh, 1,400 plus project books, over 5,000 crystals, 12,000 plus transistors and integrated circuits, and 60,000 plus toroidal cores. So 
somebody is building something somewhere i think is the message um the, it, it really is still quite popular with uh, with people and, uh, and and the sprat magazine uh, mentioned the we see all sorts of fantastic projects in there that uh, that people are still uh, getting on with and uh, uh, and long may it continue as far as i'm concerned I, I've, I've always got a few projects on the go and uh, i've currently got a, a 17 meter ssb radio that's nearly finished and an 80 meter CW transceiver with a digital VFO that uh, uh, I need to uh, to do some work on this weekend. So, um, yeah, people are still building radios. Um, for those who uh, are in the UK will know a TV programme called Blue Peter. And, and they always used to say, and here's one I made earlier. Uh, and, and this is, uh, this is a, a, a transmitter that I built um, 18 months ago, I think it was. Uh, it's actually one of George's designs, G3, uh, GM30XX. He, he had this thing called the Wonner, and uh, it was called the Wonner because it was built on a one inch square printed circuit board. Um, now, I made it slightly bigger as I don't like teeny tiny things. Uh, so, this is the two and a half, as I call it. It's two and a half inches by two and a half inches, and uh, it includes a crystal oscillator, power amplifier, uh, key in circuit and a low pass filter uh, and that produces about three four watts on uh, on 60 meters it's my first 60 meter rig that one um, so uh, yeah it's, it's a nice little qrp transmitter and uh, produces a, a really nice clean signal through that low pass filter and uh, say two and a half inches square it doesn't doesn't take up a lot of room uh, on, on the bench but um, that was something i built from scratch um, some people build kits, and I've got a few examples of kits to show you. This one's from Walford Electronics uh, down in Somerset, not too far from me in Bath. But uh, Tim uh, always has a range of kits. He keeps changing them. He keep, doesn't keep them for very long. He, he sort of always changing them, improving them. Uh, this one's a really good idea, I think, that, uh, that the front here, this, this here is a, a super het receiver. Uh, and you tell him what band you want it on. It comes as a single band uh, super head receiver uh, we use these for a build-a-thon and uh, some people had them on 20 meters some had them on 40 meters they all worked and they were all really good uh, uh, things I, I had mine running next to my yesu and i could hear everything on this that i could hear on the yesu and then if you've built that and you're happy with it you can buy a, an additional kit which is this one at the back that turns it into an ssb transceiver so it uses a lot of the circuitry in the receiver to feed this board so uh, uh, the crystal filters here and um, uh, I think the mi mixer sort of goes the other way around for the transmitter so effectively that's just a, a PA I think for, for the uh, for the output and the low pass filter uh, produces about three four watts of uh, SSB and um, uh, the one I built on the, on 20 meters I think I was up to 35 countries before I got bored with it and moved on to something else um, but great little rig and I think Less than a hundred pounds will we'll get you both kits. Um, I, think, I think it was about eighty-five or something like that. Um, so pretty good value for what you're getting, uh, and great fun building it and learning about the circuits, setting it up. It's, uh, you don't need mountains of test equipment. Um, the next one, sadly, I, I was going to take this out, but I thought I'd leave it in because I, I think it's interesting. Kanga UK have uh, been trading for a long time, but they're closed at the moment. Um, uh, Dennis, who, uh, who runs the company, has uh, decided to take retirement and uh, he's awaiting a buyer. So hopefully we'll see it again uh, in the not too distant. But these were some of his kits. He was moving into surface mount uh, technology. Uh, so you can get a 20 watt dummy load with these uh, surface mount resistors, which is a really good project if you want to see if, what surface mounts are about. If you want to try it for the first time, really good project to do uh, this is a, a receiver that we uh, we did for a build-a-thon uh, lots of room it's deliberately made bigger than it needs to be to, uh, to to let you get some practice on the surface mount components uh, and then this one is an sdr um, for uh, 80 meters i think uh, again all the surface mount stuff but a lot more densely compact than this one so i guess that's the progression from the, the first steps the second steps and the third step to uh, to use in surface mount which I, I quite enjoy now I, I i was a bit scared of it at first like a lot of people but 
having done a few projects, I, I, I quite like it. It's a, it's a different way of working, um, but probably the way we've got to go is components get easier to obtain in this format than in the traditional way. Um, QRP Labs, Hans Summers uh, has got this uh, company and uh, he produces some amazing kits. Uh, this is one of his uh, top sellers, the, the QCX uh, transceiver. Uh, again, single band CW rig, uh, but it, it's, well, it, it, what it doesn't do is probably easy to say that what it, it, what it does, it's got built-in test equipment, it's got a built-in keyer, you can use it for whisper, you can use it for CW, it's got a Morse decoder, I mean, it's just amazing uh, things. Uh, this was the original one, which he designed for our Youngsters on the Air event in 2017. Um, he's gone on to sell, well, I think about 10,000 of those kits since he, uh, he designed it. Um, he then put it into a nice box with a slightly different layout um, and, and sold a lot of that. And this is his latest version, which is the mini uh, version which uses some surface mount technology um, still puts out I think three watts or four watts of, of CW and uh, as you can see it, it fits in the palm of your hand uh, excellent kit and, and, and he does other things as well I, I've, I've got a 10 watt PA for one of my rigs from him he does a whisper beacon and things e excellent uh, excellent kits and, and nice enclosures to make them look pretty as well uh, over in India um, Ashar Farhan uh, runs a company called HF Signals, and um, th this is the micro BITX uh, project or kit. Um, there's not a lot of soldering in this. It's more of an assembly job than a soldering job, uh, but you end up with a multi-band, multi-mode uh, transceiver and uh, digital control. You can see there on the screen uh, with a case, and I think altogether a couple of hundred dollars or uh, something like that is the price I think incredible value uh, and, and great performance one of our uh, students built one of those uh, two years ago uh, and he was working the world with it he, he really really pleased it uh, I think it puts about 10 watts of SSB out Re really good uh, really good project uh, the GQRP club uh, we have some kits um, all in this sort of black uh, style. This is the ATU. Uh, we've got a transmitter and a receiver. Uh, we're hoping to add the, the digital VFO uh, to that range in the not too distant future. And um, uh, that again, single band CW things, but they uh, they work very very well. Uh, tried and tested. I'm saying thousands have been built, so we, we know that they work. So it's not all about homebrew though. You can get commercial radios um, if you've got the uh, the, the money and uh, you, you, you want to go down that route. Uh, all the big manufacturers do them and say the Chinese uh, are getting in on the market as well these days. Uh, the move of course from uh, traditional super hets into uh, software defined radio uh, is, is taking a pace and, and you know, the, the ICOM and the Zygu uh, are both SDRs. Uh, the Alicraft I think has got an SDR receiver as well. Uh, and Yesa was still producing what's now the 818. Um, but you're going to pay somewhere between £400 for the Zygu, £600 for the Yesu, £1,300-ish for the ICOM and the Ellicraft. Um, so, you know, there's the, the, the quite a high price tag attached to that. But excellent radios, and uh, you'll, you'll, you'll certainly get a lot of uh, good service uh, out of them. Um, of course, if you've got a high powered radio, you can just turn the RF power down and, and try QRP without uh, any expenditure whatsoever. Uh, you don't have to have a specific radio to, uh, to, to go QRP, you can just turn the wick down. And again, people got this idea that the QRP club is all about CW. It isn't. Um, we've got people who operate SSB. Um, this rig uh, that's on the, uh, the, the slide is by Pete Giuliano, N6QW. Um, he took one of our sudden designs, the, uh, the, the sort of club de uh, receiver. Uh, well, I adapted it for other things and he picked that idea up and took it a step further and made it into a, a, a bi-directional SSB transceiver. Uh, and as you can see, a digital VFO, VFO A and B, it's got the S meter all built in. So it's not all about CW and a couple of transistors that we, we have got some, some fairly uh, modern 
uh, approaches on this. Um, and data, yeah, pe people often overlook data as a, as a good QRP mode. And um, the, the, one of our convention talks was by Anthony uh, K8ZT. Uh, um, he, he did a talk about using FT8 and how it changed his approach to, uh, to, to work in DX. And uh, um, uh, 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 another great talk to, uh, to watch. And it's not all about HF. The, 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 there are QRP operators on, uh, on VHF uh, as well. And uh, Practical Wireless magazine run a QRP contest every year on two meters. Uh, the Radio Society of Great Britain, they do the 50 megahertz contest that has a low power section. So there's lots of opportunity for sorry, VHF, SSB, data, you name it. The, it's certainly not all about um, um, CW on HF. That's... Uh, that's that's a bit of a myth. Uh, the QRP club is uh, and the QRP community is much wider than that. Do you need good operating skills? Well, yes, you do. Um, uh, no matter what radio you use or what power you're using, it, it, it pays to be a good listener. Finding out what's going on, is the propagation working? Who's working? Who is there any point calling if uh, if there's nothing uh, happening? Um, going to the centers of activity and, and, and checking those out because that's that there are, on every band there's a QRP center of activity for CW and for SSB. Have a look around there and see if there's anybody uh, calling. You might find that they're in the quiet when others are, are, are quite busy. Um, using techniques like tail ending. I've, I've had great success with this. You, you, you hear a couple of stations working each other. Wait till they're finished and, uh, and give them a call. Um, and one of them usually will reply because they're already on the frequency, they, they, they hear you calling them specifically rather than a general CQ, uh, and, and quite often they'll, they'll come back and uh, even if they just give you a report and say, I, I can't hang about, at least you've, you've made contact. And uh, it's one of, another one of those uh, love them or hate them topics, but contests can be really useful. Uh, it, it's amazing how a QRP signal becomes audible in a contest when there's some points attached to it. Uh, then when perhaps other times that the, the, you wouldn't get heard. Um, so going on in a contest, uh, it's amazing how you can rattle up your uh, your country tally uh, when people are desperate to uh, to make the contact. So uh, um, uh, and, and there's one of our members operating with G5 LOW uh, in a VHF contest uh, a couple of years ago, which um, uh, again was, uh, was good fun. There are all sorts of awards that you can get. This is part of that challenge I talked about earlier. Um, uh, the RSGV run a foundation award, which I think is underplayed. I, I don't know why they don't make more of this. Um, it, it's great for people who've just got a foundation license to get on the air, work a few stations. I think it, 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 it may be 10 stations on four different bands and you get an award. And then if you work some more, you get a silver award and, and so on. Uh, and it's just, I think, a great way of getting people active once they've got the license, is to give them an incentive to, to be on the air. Um, obviously, the ARRL run the DXCC Award, 100 countries, and doing that with QRP is quite an achievement. Um, and that's a target I've set myself for the Cycle 25. I, I've decided that within Cycle 25, I'm going to work DXCC with QRP. Whether I achieve it or not, I don't know, but I'm going to have some fun trying. Um, in the QRP club, we've got awards for working countries with QRP, working other members, working two-way QRP, and then there's the QRP master. I always have to check my notes for this one to get it right. Um, yeah, in, in the 40-year history of the club, there's only 150 of these have been issued. So it, it's quite a, a sought-after award. And to get a QRP master, you have to work 60 members 20 DXCC countries that are two-way QRP and 75 DXCCs which may be working a QRO station. So it's quite a, a, an achievement in getting that QRP master. Um, that's, uh, that's presumably why there's not been that many awarded. And then this one, and I've got my award there, uh, to, which uh, is, uh, I'm very proud of, is the 1000 miles per watt award. Uh, and basically you divide the m number of miles that you've worked by the power that you used to work it. And uh, that was mine. It was, uh, it came out at 1,056 miles per watt from working uh, from here in Bath over to uh, Massachusetts. 
uh, KZ1H, uh, and uh, it was a, a great, uh, great contact to uh, to make, and uh, and, and excellent to, to get the award for it. So uh, uh, very happy with that. So I've prattled on for a little bit longer than I intended, but never mind. I uh, hope it's been useful. Um, quick summary of what I've covered. Um, talks about is QRP viable? Yes, it is. It's good fun. Different reasons for what uh, for going QRP. Um, you can work homebrew gear, you can work commercial gear, any mode you fancy, quite frankly. You get those rewards for achievements, things like the certificates and, and things. Um, you're not going to have to worry too much about EMF um, risk assessments. You're not going to wipe out your neighbour's telly. And if you want to join the QRP club, I'll repeat it again, it's the best value of six quid in amateur radio. Uh, we've got a long history, stable membership lots of help available we're all very friendly people um i've talked about the members benefits club sales conventions and all of that uh so if uh, if you are interested um check out the website and uh, get your membership uh, chucked in and uh, and start enjoying that um i've got a further information sheet uh, which I'll, I'll send to chris for distribution uh but two quick references the rsgb have got a book called qrp basics I believe it's just been rewritten so uh, that, that's uh, certainly a good resource and the ARRL have got their equivalent just called low power communication and a, an excellent book that is as well that's the website uh, quite easy to remember www.gqrp.com and if you get completely stuck or you want to ask a specific, specific question after um, tonight uh, that's my email address uh, again quite easy g0fuw at gqrp.co.uk and uh, yeah nice little cartoon to finish on there um, if, uh, if you can see it says good job you packed the wanna Sid the wanna being the little transmitter that uh, you can do so on a, on a shipwreck having a QRP rig in your pocket and a bit of wire and you're on the air and I suspect a DX at location like that you probably get in a pile up very quickly <laughs> So um, with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And if there are any questions, we can answer them. Thank you, Steve. Guys, you should know if you want to be able to unmute. Uh, I noticed there weren't any questions in the chat window, but uh, feel free to uh, to unmute. And um, if you've got any questions or comments, please, uh, please fire away. Uh, Steve, this is Frank, K4FMH. Uh, my southern draw would indicate that I'm at least somewhere west of you, perhaps across the body of water. Uh, I'm the bloke that uh, worked a little bit with Nick Bradley to kick off on the preliminary stage. Your very successful online uh, convention last year, so congratulations on that. Uh, thrill, thrilled at listening to your talk. I want to point out one thing. Um, I'm involved with a couple of, of people on the ICQ podcast in an international group. Uh, Don Field is a member, uh, as well as some others, for a contest we launched last year called the Portable Operations Challenge. The concept was how do you get traditional, what we call over here, California kilowatt towers, big beams, the Tim Duffy's of the world, um, running 12 Perseus SDRs just to track PSK reporter. I mean, you know, <laughs> that alone. So how do you get them in the same contest with what on over here, we do the soda activations a lot and then the parks a lot, mm -hmm. the portable carrying often QRP, but not always QRP carrying folks. How do we get them in the same contest? And you, I, I was very impressed to learn that uh, I'm following a path, not making a path. The fundamental scoring criterion uh, is the distance for power. That is uh, the, the watts per mile or kilometer in this case. And my belief from analyzing some public log data, uh, particularly the Stu Perry top band data, which reports distance, that I'm not sure that the big gun stations, if they will participate, it may be more like old Tom Morris in golf up there in Ireland. Uh, when you play by the handicap, it's much closer to that day's performance. So congratulations to you. I'll send you some information about the POC. We certainly want your club members uh, to know about it. 
I just don't think that the big guns can win if they play using that criteria. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I'm a statistician, so I go with the data, but uh, bravo for what you're doing and Georgia talk very well. Thank you very much, Frank. Well, I, I'll dig out the detail that the contest that I operated in, which, which was sort of a reverse power thing, uh, it was run by a Russian guy. And um, it, it was quite a complicated formula that you had to use to, uh, to work out your score. But I'll, I'll dig that out. And it, 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 it was certainly interesting to see how um, making a few contacts with, uh, with milliwatts actually gave you more power than uh, making 100 contacts with 10 watts or whatever. So it was... Uh, well, yeah. Steve, I, I, I never miss an opportunity to embarrass one of my fellow podcast presenters. And so M0MNG, Edmund Spicer down in, in the southern part of England, said he participated in his third or his first contest ever in the POC last year. He finished third. <laughs> yeah, it's good. It's good. I'll make a note of that. I'll get that for you, Frank. Thank you, Frank. Um, Steve, you mentioned about obviously the band plan. You've got this these centers of activity for QRP. Do people actually, is that is commonly used or do people actually hang out there? They do. Um, sadly, not everybody uh, abides by them. And uh, quite often you, you, you can be listening on the, a QRP frequency and, and it just gets stamped on by someone who, who, who doesn't appreciate that those things exist. Or if they do appreciate it, they're, um, um, they're, they're you know, just ignoring it. Um, but yeah, but the people do congregate around them. And, um, and one of the ones that's, that's particularly popular is on 60 metres, uh, you know, because we've got this channelized uh, usage of, of, uh, of 60 meters, uh, 5.262 uh, is very popular for uh, for the center of activity for, for that. So, uh, um, uh, and I certainly hang around on 14.060 uh, on 20 meters, and uh, you, you get quite a few um, get quite a few people hanging around, um, you know, a few kilohertz either side. So it, it does work. That's cool. I know people call, sometimes call kind of slash QRP. It's probably not an official suffix but is that does that sometimes work help we to people to sort of maybe want to wait because you because you are qrp sometimes yeah um it's one of those things some people say it's illegal um the dealings i had with ofcom when i was with the rsgb um that their view was there's nothing in the license to stop you putting a suffix like stroke qrp or some people put um, bicycle mobile or pedestrian <laughs> mobile or things there's nothing illegal about that it, it's just not the normal thing that many people do um i i tend not to do it unless um somebody's looking for qrp stations and uh, I, I was here in the shack one day and um the, the, there was a couple of guys rag chewing on on 20 meters and i I'd built a radio and it was just literally spread across the bench and um they, they were sort of every now and again is there anybody else out there that wants to join in for a chat uh and the, one of them said, are there any QRP stations listening? And there was a long pause. So I, I picked the microphone up and called him. And uh, he was over in the States. Um, and my rig was, I think it was running about two and a half watts at the time into a dipole. And, and we had a chat and, and he was chuffed a bit to, uh, to work the, uh, with the QRP. So I wasn't calling QRP, but I was responding to someone who was looking for QRP stations. And, um, but, uh, but yeah, some people do it. Uh, some people do it all the time. That you know to signify they're a low power station. And uh, I, I don't know. I think um, it, it's uh, it, it's it's one of those things that if you st- if you're in a pub, you'd start an argument. I'm sure. <laughs> Are there sort of? I mean, I always mentioned about doing QRP to QRP, and I guess that perhaps that's sometimes because you're using certain parts of the band. The band. Do you, are there any QRP nets at all? Any, any, where you sort of organise yourselves together to to have conversations QRP to QRP. I wouldn't say it's a net, but every Monday is uh, QRP activity day. Right. And uh, Colin, G3VTT, he, he's the ringleader of that. Um, he's over in Kent and, and he gets on the bands and uh, people join him and uh, people try and work each other on a Monday. Um, and, and you usually get reports on the, the QRP club um, sort of email group in the evening of who's worked who and, and so on. So I say it's not a net as such, but it's a it's a sort of get together on a Monday, um, and uh, the winter sports between Christmas and New Year. Uh, that that's almost you know you, you use the census of activity for that, and that's where you are looking to work other QRP stations if you can. Cool. 
Thank you. Has anybody else got any questions or comments for Steve before we wrap things up? Not seeing anybody coming off mute. Oh, hang on, Tim, Tim, I think Tim's got a question. <laughs> Tim's got his thumb up. Yeah, thank you. Just trying to find the unmute there. <laughs> um, technology challenging us. Quick question for you, Steve. Um, sort of operating procedures. We were talking earlier about using the QRP designated. Is it like a calling channel or is it good to just continue to use that frequency, that channel, that, that specific frequency, or is it good form to QSY and not rag you, or how, how does it work in practice? Okay, they used to be called calling frequencies. Um, some people still do call them calling frequencies, but the IARU prefer this term, uh, center of activity. Uh, okay. And the idea is that if everybody was trying to wait to use that one frequency, then um, um, it's, it's very difficult to, um, uh, to get everybody on the same frequency. Obviously, as, as you say, you, if it was FM or something, you'd make the call and then QSY to, to another channel. Uh, mm. what, what people tend to do is, is a few kilohertz either side of the center activity um, means that you, you, you're in the same sort of mix, if you like. Um, so um, certainly on, on CW, if you tune five kilohertz up and five down around the center of activity, you usually find somebody uh, calling or nattering away. Uh, same with the, with the SSB frequencies. So it's not as hard and fast as a calling channel, um, mm. but it, it gives you a focus of somewhere to go to to, to look for, for something. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That, that help? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, you tend to put the call out, maybe not on the on that bang on the, the centre of activity and, and see what happens and, and stick with that frequency. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Lovely talk. Fascinating. Thank you. Thank you. Quite inspiring. Good. Cheers, Tim. Um, Edmunds, I think you've got a question in the chat window. Do you want to uh, unmute or do you want me to, uh, to read it out? I'll unmute myself. How about that? Good evening, uh, Steve and Chris and everybody. A uh, quick question about the 60 metre band. I knew about 5262 for... CW, but um, simply because I'm too lazy to look it up, I thought I would ask you, Steve, is there an equivalent thing for SSB for inter-G contacts on 60 metres? Um, there isn't a QRP frequency, but I'm pretty sure there is um, a centre of activity for SSB um, because you've got this odd thing where you have to use um, upper sideband on uh, on you know below 10 megs if you're on five megs because everybody uses up a sideband um i don't have it to hand but the, there is a, a, a one of the, the the they're not channels are they but bandlet or uh, whatever they want to call it a little bit of spectrum that that is used for uh, for ssb um and of course it, one of the problems we've got with 60 meters is the chunks of it that don't line up with the rest of the world and um the primary user is very uh, precious about it, and it, it, it's uh, it, it's it's a bit sad that we can't line things up with the uh, with with the warp curve allocations, and then at least everybody uh, will be somewhere about the same frequency. Um, but the, there is an SSB frequency. I just don't know what it is off the top of my head. I'm glad to hear you say that because I, I was wondering if I'd missed it because. I, I know that there, there definitely is a CW QRP mm. frequency, 5262, but I didn't remember seeing in the band plans or anywhere else for that matter, any reference specifically to a QRP SSB frequency. Mm -hmm. So at right. least I know I've not been blinking and missing it. Thanks very much, Steve, and uh, keep up the good work. Thank you very much. I'll do my best. And if, if I find that, I'll, uh, I'll pass it back to Chris. Thanks. Thank you, Edmunds. Um, okay, so any any final questions for Steve before we uh, before we finish up? I'm just checking everyone's picture. Okay, well, with that in mind, Steve, thank you very very much. That was a really really fascinating talk, and I'm sure you've inspired some people there to get out and and operate with some low power. <laughs> 
uh, if they weren't thought about doing it already. Um, just one thing you mentioned. You mentioned about the um, the uh, EMF assessments. We have got a talk next month from Leslie Butterfield. So uh, if you want to learn about how that works, is how to calculate your station's power and all that sort of thing and make sure you're not going to cook next door's cat or something, then, uh, <laughs> then please join us next month and we'll, uh, we'll go through it there. Uh, Steve, thank you very, very much. That was a fantastic talk and uh, we, we'll give you a virtual clap. Uh, <laughs> you can see people on the video and uh, we'll, uh, we'll close things down there. So, so thank you very much. Well, thank you for having me. It's been very uh, enjoyable and, and great to see you guys uh, uh, for some new faces and, uh, and, and put faces to names. Thank you. Great. Okay. Thanks a lot. We'll wrap things up there. Cheers. Seven threes. Thanks a lot.